Uh, hello, I am Judith Klein. Um, I work at a company called Cactus Lab in Auckland. We do iOS apps and websites. Uh, as I mentioned, it's the first time I'm not introducing myself as a student, which is kind of strange. And I'm talking today about iBeacons. That worked. Um, so there's a few things we're going to cover. Uh, I'm going to give you a simple introduction, a uh, basic overview, uh, kind of how beacons are being used, what you can use them for, uh, kind of the problem that exists with them. Uh, the way I present or the title of this talk is, you know, the, the, yeah, the, it's, it's about the buzz and kind of what, why has there been a buzz and why has it disappeared. Uh, I'm going to talk about some recipes. So rather than here's how to do it exactly, here's how to implement beacons, there's heaps and heaps of sample code out there, which, so I don't want to replicate more of that. It's more, these are the gotchas that you'll come up against if you are working with beacons and so what you can do to work around those. Uh, looking forward, what we can actually do that's interesting with beacons, uh, again, what might have come across from the blurb is that uh, there's been a lot of use in retail um, and not a lot beyond that. And finally, just some best practices. So, Beacons were first announced at WWDC in 2013, but the buzz kind of really took off last year. They were, is a buzzword you kind of heard everywhere from retail, enterprise, retail, education, retail, uh, everywhere in between. Some articles went as far as to call it Apple's next revolution. Uh, in the window after Beacons came out and before the iPhone 6 came out, before, uh, after they came out, before iPhone 6 came out, some were speculating that this meant that Apple had no need for NFC, that this was their solution to it. It was hailed as the NFC killer because of its comparative low power, uh, low power consumption, greater range, and hey, all devices already have Bluetooth, don't they? What amazed me more than the buzz itself was how often I felt like I was seeing this phrase everywhere, that Apple quietly announced iBeacons. Uh, with WWDC, everything was still, of course, under NDA, and so it's possible that they didn't reach public awareness until late 2013 when iOS 7 actually came out. Welcome! And, um, and, with, and perhaps with amongst all the other excitement around iOS 7 and the big changes, it got lost in, in amongst that. But as quickly as it came, the, the buzz just seemed to dissipate just as quickly. And I don't know about you, but I'm yet to have my first beacon encounter in the wild. So... What the heck are they? This is a beacon. Much like a lighthouse, a beacon serves the purpose of enabling someone to find their position or relative proximity to something, whether it be rocks under the water or a great deal on shoes. This is also a beacon, and probably one of the most recognizable brands of beacon you will see. Um, it's one called Estimote. It's one that I've used a lot. I've tried a few different brands of beacons, and this was the one that I found the best to use. Uh, they have their own SDK, but you can use it with Apple's core location frameworks, which I'll talk about. The lingo is used a bit interchangeably, but just to clear things up, iBeacon is the name of the protocol that was standardized by Apple, and a beacon is a Bluetooth low-energy device that conforms to this protocol. I may accidentally use these terms interchangeably, and it's quite common to actually hear beacon and iBeacon used interchangeably. The most important thing to remember is that beacons are simple. Don't overcomplicate them. If you're interacting with a beacon through your app, you get access to only very few things. Come back remote. <laughs> you get access to these things. And let's start by looking at UUID, uh, UDID. UUID. I always mix those up. The same way a lighthouse has a flashing pattern that distinguishes it from other lighthouses. If you didn't know that already, I learned that last year. Beacons have a UUID, or a universally unique identifier. If you need to generate one, open up Terminal and type in UUID gen. And then that will keep giving you nice UUIDs, kind of what they look like. You can keep going, and it'll just give you UUIDs till the end of time. In code, there is a NSUUID object, which you can use, either to hold your UUID from generate from a string, so you can paste it in there, or you can just get it to generate one for you automatically, but usually you'll probably want to create one yourself so you can reuse it and you know what it actually is. Um, so in that case, that's actually generating a string from it, but if you take off the UUID string, it's a UUID object. Pretty simple. You get major and minor, which are both 16-bit unsight ints, and this is what helps you distinguish 
between beacons when you have multiple beacons with the same UUID. This is more or less just an arbitrary number that you can assign meaning to based on the logic of your app. If you only have one beacon that your app's interested in, you might not care about the major and the minor. These first three values is what the beacon gives you. And you use them to identify the beacon, and these next three things are used together to determine the distance of the beacon as reported back by your beacon object. RSSI is the received signal strength. I might give up on the swatch actually now. Uh, the first three, uh, yeah, RSSI is the received signal strength of the beacon measured in decibels and accuracy and represents the accuracy of coordinate value in meters. I personally have never used this. I haven't found a need to. Um, unless you're doing something that requires actually a lot of accuracy, but again, I'm more on that later. Proximity is the relative distance of the beacon to the uh, accuracy. Yes. Uh, proximity is the relative distance of the beacon to the user's device, where immediate is within a few centimeters, near is within a couple of meters, and far is greater than 10 meters away. Again, more on this later, um, and whether or not that is actually accurate or not. I've, that's usually the one I rely on most, and that's given me most of what I need to know. Usually that's what you're interested in. Is this person immediately in front of the beacon? Are they kind of nearby, or have they only kind of just come into range, or... I don't know, you can kind of pick up on it, but I don't know exactly where it is. But let's take a step, a step back. The problem beacon solve is that of indoor positioning. When you monitor for beacons, you are using the same region monitoring APIs that have existed since iOS 4, which is part of core location. And the way region monitoring works is that you specify a latitude and a longitude value as the center point of the region you're interested in. You specify a radius. And then from there, you can receive notifications from a delegate if your user enters or exits that region. When monitoring for beacons, you initialize your region not with a latitude longitude value, but with a beacon. And so it becomes a beacon region initialized with that UUID you're interested in. You can receive the same entry and exit notifications, or you can say, give me all the beacons nearby with that UUID, with that beacon region. The benefit of using a region is obviously it's not something static. It could be here or here, and you don't have to know that latitude, longitude value. You're not tied to a physical coordinate, and location becomes a lot more dynamic. And the biggest win with beacons is that it offers more precise indoor location positioning. Outdoors, if you previously did any work with uh, core location, the most accuracy you can get outdoors is using GPS, and that is usually really good. Uh, but as soon as you go indoors, you use that, and then it drops down to the next level of accuracy, which uses Wi-Fi triangulation. So previously, one solution to indoor positioning used to be just setting up lots and lots and lots and lots of wireless access points, um, which was done in a lot of places. The uh, Mona and Hobart did this. Um, don't know if they still do. Uh, and they got really good accuracy with that from what I've heard. But beacons offer the same functionality, and it's a difference between being able to determine what building someone is in to what room they're in, what table they're sitting at, what pair of shoes they're looking at, what artwork they're looking at, those kinds of things. So it's a really fine-grained micro-location. So, if you want to make a beacon app, you need to be familiar with the basics of core location, which I'm not going to go into too in-depth, but you will be using the core location framework. So which means you need to be aware of some of the rules of using a user's location. And that means don't forget to import the framework. Uh, I say this every time, and it still trips myself and people up. You have to request access to the user's location, and in iOS 8, this means you have to specify whether you want when in use permission or always. So always is if you want to run in the background. If you're targeting earlier versions of iOS, specific iOS 7, you have to do a response to selector check, <coughs> otherwise you will get a crash. Um, and also in iOS 8, you have to... Oh, there we go. And also in iOS 8, you have to specify the usage in your info.plist, so that's what the user will see in the alert, and when they go to change their privacy settings, say that this is why this app wants to use your location. You'll always be at the mercy of the user. They can, just because they've granted you permission, they can switch, it at any, switch off at any time. Uh, so you should always do a check to make sure what authorization you have. Um, if location is not available, fail gracefully, Give the user a meaningful message and gently tell them where they should go to give you permission to access their location, where they can switch it back on. As I mentioned before, region monitoring is using your region monitoring APIs, 
and are bound by the same constraints. So you can only, you only monitor 10 regions or 10 beacon regions at, the at a time. So it's 10 of all, not 10 of each. So therefore, using major and minor is a great way to get around that because you can monitor for 20 or as many beacons as you want with the same UUID and still only counts as one region. All right. At high level, what does the world of beacon use look like? These are the things you can do with beacons. You can see if there's a beacon nearby. You can get information about that beacon's, beacon's major and minor value. You can get information about the proximity of strength, but again, that's reported to you by a delegate rather than the beacon itself. And that's kind of it. As I said, beacons aren't complicated. Everything else is how you interpret and respond to that beacon. Inversely, there's a few things you can't do, and I've actually had a lot of scaremongering around some of this. Um, beacons are opt-in technology. So you, as I mentioned with location awareness, your user must explicitly give permission for your app to look for beacons. And you, you, cannot, your app, you cannot say, hey, what beacons are around with just any UUID? I think there is a way to put in a wildcard, but <laughs> Apple will ban your app if, or not allow it to pass if you do that, because that is not allowed. Um, you must know the UUID of the beacon you're interested in. And ranging as well, we'll only return the beacons you specified. You cannot say, hey, what's your UUID? And you can't sort of trans, this is another misconception that uh, and, and the beacon just say things to you, that you can walk past a beacon and it will send you a message. That's not the way it works. It's literally just saying, hi, I'm a beacon. Um, apps scan for beacons and not the other way around. It is a one-way interaction. Um, like most modern lighthouses, the lighthouse keeper has become obsolete and there's no one at home, no one to signal to. Therefore, if you're walking down the street and being bombarded with different beacon ads or whatever, maybe change up some of your location privacy settings and delete some apps. So, so far we've established that beacons are great and easy to use. Uh, it's no wonder that they're quickly embraced by various industries, most notoriously so retail. So it stands to reason they're a great solution for indoor positioning and already being used in shops, galleries, transportation, restaurants. Etc. But these are all valid examples of uses of beacons, and don't get me wrong, but perhaps for the average developer, it's not the most relevant. Who's excited about retail? There we go. Uh, oh, a couple of people. So yes, very relevant uses. But average, for the average developer, it's not the most relevant, and I suspect it's part of the reason that the buzz has died down. And this is because the reason these retail apps work well is because it's set up for a specific location. Uh, the developer has control over the environment and the beacons within it. But if you're deploying a beacon app on the store, uh, that changes, changes everything. How can you deploy an app with a beacon, with beacon functionality to everyone in the world and make sure that there's that beacon around that they're interested in? Obviously, if your app does other things, that's fine, but if you don't know that they're going to ever come by that beacon. And so that's one of the reasons I think beacons has, that, that interest has sort of tapered off. It's not really something that can be integrated easily into a mainstream app. How do we solve this problem? What else can we do with beacons? This is also a beacon. And thankfully, there are million people, millions of people around the world carrying beacons. Because these can become beacons. They're enabled with Bluetooth low energy. Even though you can buy physical beacons at a dime in a dozen now, there's a lot more power in using this. The main examples you'll see are beacons used to represent a location. You're not limited to location just because you're using the core location framework. Beacons can represent a thing, any physical object with Bluetooth capabilities or anything you can attach a beacon to. Most importantly, beacons can also represent people and I don't mean strapping beacons to your friends like this poor dog here. <laughs> Um, this video was, for, uh, was created by some, there's a beacon app created and launched by some people at a vend in New Zealand. And I thought that was great. They brought the dog and the app to iOS Meetup. <laughs> so, what that then means is that the person next, next, uh, the person next to a user running your app could also be a beacon. You suddenly have a new way to interact with people nearby. Even though we have so many great ways of interacting with people all over the world, Apps love connecting you with people nearby. I was getting notifications from Facebook telling me that a friend is attending an event near me today. You've got neighborhood sharing on Swarm. You've got 
yeah, so I get started on apps like Tinder, etc. We're interested in people nearby and connecting people with them. Location lookup using GPS is expensive, GPS is power hungry, and Bluetooth low energy is cheap. It's in the name. However, there's not a lot of value in simply knowing if someone is nearby. So again, it's up to it's up to you as a developer to do something interesting with that information. <laughs> now, as I mentioned, traditionally I would have made a small follow-along project and would have gone through, seen how it works. Uh, that would have been a very interesting demo because it's very easy. Uh, but again, the buzz of the the benefit of the beacon buzz is that there's just screeds and screeds of sample code out there, and so I didn't feel it was relevant to add more. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to go through some recipes for how to solve some of the common problems that you'll face during your implementation of beacons. So your base recipe is your everyday operations, where you have geofencing, which is the entry and exit notifications. So you start monitoring for a region, and you get told if for that beacon region, and you get told if your user enters or exits that region. Your other option is ranging. So this is the one that I, I've been using more often, and this is the one that tells you, you say, here's my beacon region, and it says, okay, here you go, here are, here's an array of beacons that are in that region. So again, if you're monitoring multiple, re multiple beacon regions, it specifies what region, it hands you which region, and the array of beacons. Um, it says that the, that array of beacons, it's assumed that the first object is the closest. Uh, this tripped me up for quite a long time, actually, because I, was, I couldn't figure out why it was giving me the one over there. And it actually turns out this is based on those proximity values, where the enum value for unknown is zero, so it will hand you the unknown one first. Um, I don't know if this changes, but this gave me a huge headache. So, um, do, if there's multiple beacons, just do a check and make sure the first one isn't an unknown value. Um, it will sometimes also call, the delegate method will call you, even if there's no beacons in the array. So as always, just good practice, make sure that array of beacons isn't empty. Otherwise, bad things happen. So this brings me to the first recipe, which is interacting with multiple beacons. Um, how do you collect these beacons and identify them? If you've got an app where you're expecting to find multiple beacons and you're interested in finding out which one is the closest, uh, relying on proximity alone isn't necessarily always enough. And especially when you first start arranging, if you grab that first array you're handed, it might not be, you might, I found that you do need to normalize the values you're getting a bit, um, just to understand the values you're seeing. So this is kind of the workflow that I ended up adopting in my beacon app, where I started arranging for beacons. I, if there are multiple beacons and the first one was unknown, I'd discard it and just kind of take the next one. The f then whichever one was then determined to be the closest, I would add it to a set. And then I, I do that, I repeat that 10 times and every time the delegate handed me the array of beacons. And after that, after sort of 10 times, I'd check in that set and see which one occurred the most frequently. And this one's the one I'd assume to be the closest beacon. And I found this actually worked really well. It does mean you do have a bit of a delay as your app does collect those beacons, uh, collect those values, but you could actually just start by taking that first value, normalize it, and then update it if you need to. The other thing, so again, Bluetooth Low Energy isn't power hungry, but you should always be respectful of your use of battery life. Uh, and if your beacons are stationary objects that you aren't expecting to move, uh, you won't necessarily need to be scanning constantly. So if you're using the method from previous slide, one thing you can do is you stop, click, stop scanning after you've collected your first 10 values, and then only scan once you've detected that your user has moved. And you can use this doing, you can do this using the M7 chip or the accelerometer, depending what devices you're targeting. I found that the accelerometer worked better for this rather than the chip, because even though the, the chip gives you walking and different kinds of movement, um, I got a lot of funny looks as I was running around the office testing and seeing which one gave me the best response. Um, and then one, if you detect movement, you can then start scanning, see if they're closer to a different beacon. This is actually something recommended to me by the engineers at WWDC Labs, and it's something that worked really well for me. So your workflow will look something like this. And even if you end up looking, like, looking ridiculous running around the office, you have to test. In a perfect world, standard beacons do have a range of 70 meters. You can get long-range beacons as well, but so many things can actually affect the values you're getting. Walls and people, 
furniture can dampen its signal. And so you make sure you do test in environments you expect an app to run in. And there are some apps that do sort of triangulation based on the values you're getting, so that's another possibility. But unless you are, do need to know uh, exactly where the user is in the room, you, you might not necessarily be too worried about accuracy and knowing exactly how far away your user is from a beacon. But for that, you can use a combination of proximity, RSSI, and accuracy values to get the best possible result if you are relying on precise values. But always check these values, because as I mentioned, proximity can return unknown, and RSSI can return negative to signify that the actual accuracy could not be determined. So, as I mentioned, you can use a device as a beacon. And this is still, this is our recipe two for broadcasting. So transmit, again, this too is very simple. You import core Bluetooth, remember to import the framework. You adhere to the CB peripheral manager delegate, create a peripheral manager, create a beacon region. So because this time instead of scanning for a beacon region, we are going to be the beacon region. And then you create the, call the peripheral data with measured power in the beacon region to create a peripheral data dictionary. And then you pass the dictionary you get handed to the peripheral manager to start advertising. And that's more or less it. You can set the power at which you advertise as well. So then, with multiple, if you want to then transmit multiple beacons, in some instances you may want more than one beacon at a time, um, and to do this, you don't create multiple managers, and instead, you create an array of beacons, and then just rotate the advertisements every one to 10 seconds. 10 seconds tends to work best to allow for other devices to actually give them time to pick up on that signal. And I, this is something I've played around with as well, and actually does work quite well. So you're limited to transmitting one, one beacon region at a time, but then you just rotate that. and start advertising. Uh, for our third recipe, um, as I mentioned earlier, you are limited to monitoring for 10 regions, whether they're geographic regions or beacon regions. Uh, and however you do that, however, what you can do is you can dynamically switch between re which regions you're monitoring for, simply by stopping and starting region monitoring or ranging. And this could be through direct user interaction or some other aspect of their behavior. If you've got some people walking down, if you've got an app that looks for people with similar interests based on a beacon they're transmitting, they can toggle what those interests are, and hey, I've just walked near someone who is also interested in coffee, and then you can alert those people. Um, another, one common example of this is another, an app can alert a user if they're near one of their favorite coffee shops. And you can toggle based on their geographic location, and I think this is similar to what the Starbucks app does. Um, because if you're in one city, there's no point monitoring for regions in a different city. So there can be a lot of that logic there to get around that. So as we look forward, we must first ask ourselves, why haven't beacons taken off? H has anyone actually had a beacon encounter in the wild? A couple of hands, it's good. But why aren't we seeing them being used everywhere like this, this hype promised? What we need to move past is the idea of a beacon as a standalone physical device. If beacons could be embedded into devices that already have a power supply, this, this, this gets rid of the problem of battery life. Uh, when I first started using my estimates, I think the batteries died in a couple of weeks. And the, I don't know if they've changed now, but the first generation of estimates, you couldn't take out the battery without a craft knife. Um, but what if you could put a beacon in every light bulb? Suddenly, they have a power supply. Almost all HomeKit devices have Bluetooth built in, and why aren't they being used as beacons? Many Bluetooth chips allow for a simple beacon to be transmitted. Beacon is, iBeacon is a protocol and a, and a standard. We're not waiting for anything. Companies like Estimote are a great product and development platform, but they're exactly that. They're a development platform. Their beacons are, it says on box developer kits. When you start seeing those in public, that's kind of part of the problem. As, as I've spoken already, this causes issues around scalability. And by not having control of the environment the beacons are in, but by not having control of that environment. Why can beacon UUIDs be standardized the same way we do with things like the codes for NFC? 
the same way that web services have APIs that you can build apps for, why don't shopping malls have beacon listings <coughs> that you can build around? You shouldn't have to build the infrastructure, but rather you can adopt that infrastructure. After all, we're software people, not hardware people. The power of micro-location has immense power, and this is something that Apple is very big on, is accessibility. Where you could literally guide a visually impaired person through any building. Imagine, again, if you had a beacon in every, in every light bulb. You could tap into a Bluetooth device and give them a fine-tuned location of where they need to go. The potential is there with beacons to do something really powerful around navigation. There's also great applications for places like hospitals where a doctor could walk up to any patient and immediately get medical records in front of them. And again, that's, that's still a very simple example. There's a great article that I came across quite a while ago, actually, from a local Aussie. I don't know if anyone knows Aaron Stevenson, um, who wrote this great blog post of it's time to move on, and he outlined different ways in which beacons could be used in... In, in a hospital, for example, if a contagious patient started wandering around, and then you could see who they'd come in contact with. And then if someone started showing that symptom, they could, you could see who they'd come in contact with, things like that. Ultimately, stop trying to use them to make a quick buck, but that could go for any app. Um, start, to reach, start to wrap up, and let's look at some best practices. Again, I can't stress this enough, location is sacred on iOS, so use it sensibly and use it meaningfully. You don't have to be an exercise or a transit app to be able to harness the power of location and to add meaningful context to your app. But don't use it for the sake of using it. And this, of course, means the user is always in control. They can revoke that access any time, so check that you have the permission you need and fail gracefully if you don't. If you're monitoring for beacons in the background, you need to make sure that your app, also, again, has permission to run in the background. And this, too, can be disabled by the user. And on a similar note, beacon region monitoring is run as a system service, which this is good news. It means you, that even if your app is killed or not running at all, you can still be woken for region monitoring changes, which is the entry and exit notifications. Uh, this does not include ranging. Ranging can run in the background, but not if your app is killed. If you're using beacons, as I mentioned again before, take into account battery life. Um, Estimode beacons, I'm pretty sure some of the other ones can do let you change the power level at which you're transmitting. A higher power level obviously means you can detect it further away, greater range, um, but this will also deplete the battery even faster if you're using the standalone beacons. You can actually get some USB beacons as well, which are cool because, again, it means you have the power supply. And I found that battery level can affect a lot with the, with the readings you're getting and how it determines how far away they are. So if you have a beacon uh, further away at a higher power, your app might decide that's a closer than an app closer to you at a lower power. So always make sure if you are doing something like that that they're all transmitting at the same level. Um, and there's also nothing more frustrating than trying to troubleshoot why your beacon isn't showing up to find, in fact, it's the battery that's dead and not your code failing. Again, you learn from experience. Not all devices are compatible with beacons. Only devices from 2012 onwards have Bluetooth Low Energy. This mostly isn't a problem, as uh, the beacon APIs only work on iOS 7 onwards. Uh, so the only real gotcha here is the iPad 2. Again, speak from experience. It doesn't necessarily give you any kind of meaningful message of why your beacon isn't showing up. Um, the other... The other interesting thing I found when I was looking, trying out some working with this was that if you have Bluetooth turned off, it won't always tell you that either. If you try to transmit a beacon and you don't have Bluetooth turned on, well, it won't tell you. So that's always fun. Next, don't forget Macs as well. Many Macs running Mavericks are also compatible, with the Bluetooth compatibility cutoff point being somewhat ambiguous, but somewhere around the 2011 mark. If you're making cross-platform apps, great news. As I mentioned, iBeacon is a standard. It's a protocol. It's not limited to iOS. So you can show your Android apps some love, too. Available on Android 4.3 onwards. So that's me. Um, I, I do have... So as I mentioned, I've worked a bit, quite a bit with beacons and a beacon app. So um, I don't think I have time for questions because we're about to change over. But feel free to grab me in point, tweet me email me, um, and I love talking about beacons. And thank you for coming.